Thank you so much for joining us, either here in person at CSIS or online. My name is Hadir Ali, and I'm the Director of the Diversity and Leadership in International Affairs Project here at CSIS. DLIA is the hub for all diversity, equity, and inclusion-related efforts at CSIS. Since its inception in 2017, the program has been dedicated to elevating diverse voices and perspectives. CSIS believes that a diverse workforce leads to more ideas, more innovation, and more robust policy solutions. We strive to be a thought leader within the DI and national security space, all while supporting internal DI initiatives within the center. Last year, in June 2022, the State Department appointed Desiree Cormay-Smith as the State Department's first Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice. The position was guided by two mandates. One, protect and advance the human rights of people belonging to marginalized racial and ethnic communities. And two, to combat systemic racism, discrimination, and xenophobia around the world. Now, a full year later, to commemorate this anniversary, DLIA is honored to host the Special Representative at CSIS for a timely discussion on her accomplishments, what's to come, and the importance of racial equity in foreign policy and diplomacy. Prior to her appointment, Special Representative Cormay Smith served as a senior advisor in the Department's Bureau of International Organization Affairs, along with previous positions with the Open Society Foundations as the Senior Policy Advisor for Africa, Europe, and Eurasia, and Albright Stonebridge Group as Africa Practice as Senior Director. Ms. Desiree Cormay Smith began her career as a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department with assignments in Mexico, South Africa, and Washington, D.C. Ms. Cormay is the recipient of four State Department Meritorious Honor Awards, the Thomas Pickering Foreign Affairs Undergraduate Fellowship. She's an alumnus of the International Career Advancement Program and is a member of the 2019 Class of Next Generation National Security Leaders Fellowship at the Center for New American Security. She was honored by New America as a 2020 Black American National Security and Foreign Policy Next Generation Leader, and is a 2020 alumnus of the New Leadership Council, Washington, D.C. chapter. Ms. Cormais currently serves on the Advisory Council of Global Kids, an educational nonprofit aimed to inspire underserved youth to pursue careers in, in public policy and foreign affairs, and on the advisory board of Shea Lean, a social enterprise dedicated to empowering women in West Africa and the United States. Ms. Cormay is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and she's received degrees from both Stanford and Harvard University. We're honored to have you join us here today. I'd like to now welcome to the stage Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice, Desiree Cormay Smith, for her keynote remarks. Thank you so much, Hadil, and good afternoon, everyone. I know it's Friday afternoon, but good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right. This is exciting. It's my one-year anniversary or one-year birthday, however you uh, want to call it. But I am so honored to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, as Hadil said in that very gracious introduction, my name is Desiree Cormier-Smith, and I am honored uh, to be the State Department's first ever Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice. Thank you all for joining us here in person and online for this fireside chat to reflect on the first year of this historic role, which I am honored to occupy. It has been almost exactly one year since Secretary Blinken announced the creation of this position and appointed me to this role. And I'm grateful to our friends here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Diversity and Leadership in International Affairs Project for helping us to celebrate the first of what hopefully will be many more anniversaries to come. I would also like to pause to acknowledge that we are gathered here this afternoon on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples. We honor their contributions and resilience today, and I pay respect to their elders, both past and present. 
As the Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice, as Hadil said, my mandate is twofold. First, to ensure U.S. foreign policy, processes, and programs promote and advance the human rights of people belonging to marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities, including people of African descent, and to build global partnerships to combat systemic racism, discrimination, and xenophobia around the world. Not because we have solved these challenges yet in the United States, but because we recognize that these are global challenges that will require global and coordinated solutions. My mandate was created because the Biden-Harris administration acknowledges the global nature of systemic racism. Yet, there are many people who may question the need for our diplomats to focus on racism in other countries. Why should the State Department be spending time, energy, and resources examining the effects of systemic racism in promoting equity around the world? Well, one reason is that the State Department's top priority is the protection of Americans and American interests. We are doing this work because our country is diverse and multiracial and multicultural. This work is about helping to combat racism, discrimination, and xenophobia everywhere for the safety of U.S. citizens inside and outside our borders. We are doing this work to promote inclusive development, representative democracy, human rights, and political and economic stability around the world, and that is good for everyone. Another important reason my role exists is because while we acknowledge the very real and ongoing challenges we are facing here in the United States to fully address the long and lingering legacies of the forced relocation of Native Americans and the enslavement of Africans and their descendants, we also recognize that these challenges are not unique to the United States. It's not just us. Structural racism, discrimination, and xenophobia are global scourges that require global solutions. As the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, put it plainly, and I quote, no country in the world is free of racism, end quote. After one year in my job, I can attest to the importance of taking a critical look at our foreign policies, processes, assistance, and programs to identify ways we can better advance the human rights of members of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities, including people of African descent, and more effectively combat systemic racism, discrimination, violence, and xenophobia globally. This work is important, but this work is also really hard. And that is why I'm really grateful that it has been a huge team effort. I attended an event at the National Museum of African American History and Culture a few weeks ago, and someone from civil society, a Brazilian woman, gave me a shirt with a phrase in Portuguese. Now, I don't speak Portuguese yet, so when I got to my office, I looked it up, and the text on the shirt translated to, Justice is a black woman, and she does not walk alone. And I thought it was so profound and so meaningfully, so meaningful as a black woman. And it also made me reflect how this work has been and must be a collective effort in order to be successful and sustainable. Each of us here today in our various respective fields must all work in concert to uproot systemic racism and all forms of discrimination from our society and our global community. When bigotry, hate, and indifference win, we all lose. But if we harness the power of our collective brilliance in pursuit of a more equal and a more just world, we can build a better world than the one we've got now. Our president often says, our country and the world are at an inflection point. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I would add that we have to be the ones to bend it. My team and my colleagues at the State Department are doing this work not only because it's the right thing to do. Our nation will unquestionably be safer and more prosperous when we address the deeply rooted inequities that are caused by racism around the world. When we defend the rights of all people, all human beings around the world, of women and girls in their diversity, people of African descent, LGBTQI plus persons, 
indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and people of every ethnic background and religion, we promote stronger, more representative democracies, more stable societies, more prosperous economies, and more peace and stability. And again, that is good for everyone. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today on how racial equity and justice is a core pillar of democracy promotion, of human rights, and of US national security more broadly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Desiree, for that. Um, before we start our conversation here today, um, a couple of things. You're an ICAPper. I am. I am as well. You did it, you said 2015? Yes. A fantastic program that I'm grateful for and for its network. You also uh, talked about Global Kids. Yes. A fantastic organization that CSIS has had the honor to, to partner with in the last couple of years as well. Desiree, I know you alluded to some of this at the beginning, the context that led to, to this role. I'm sure for some people that might have been a surprise, but for others, it was a long way coming. Could you share a little bit more about the context and some of the challenges that led to the, the importance of creating this role? Yeah, well, you know, this was not an overnight effort, right? To be clear, this role was created thanks to the decades of advocacy and activism from people inside and outside of the State Department to acknowledge the realities of systemic racism as a national security imperative. To acknowledge that for people of African descent, for indigenous peoples, for Roma people, their human rights are consistently and systematically denied simply because of their race or ethnicity. And so um, it was a great honor uh, to be asked by Secretary Blinken to assume this role um, in June of 2022. I must also, I think it would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, I think, the propelling effect that the murder of George Floyd had on the conversations about racial inequities and racial injustices around the world, not just in our country, right? But following the murder of George Floyd, we saw the EU establish an mm -hmm. EU anti-racism coordinator. Mm -hmm. We saw Canada stand up an anti-racism secretariat, right? Um, we saw the Human Rights Council in Geneva, led by the Africa Group mm -hmm. and, and US civil society, frankly, um, put forward a historic resolution um, calling for the creation of an independent mechanism to look at the realities of systemic racism in law enforcement globally, not just in the United States, globally. Mm -hmm. So we were seeing these conversations around the world mm -hmm. that encouraged people to no longer sort of wish racism away, mm. right, or ignore racism away. Um, and so I think that was also uh, a propelling movement or an event that sort of built upon the decades of advocacy. Um, and, you know, I would also be remiss if I didn't um, talk about President Biden's commitment to advancing racial equity um, through his entire administration. So on his very first day in office, he signed Executive Order 13985 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. That mandated a whole of government approach to identifying barriers to opportunity uh, for members of marginalized, historically underrepresented and marginalized communities. That includes people of African descent, mm -hmm. that includes um, indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. that includes uh, LGBTQI plus folks, right? So this is equity writ large. Um, and so the creation of my position was a part of that mm -hmm. commitment under President Biden's mandate from that executive order. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sure like with any new role, there's a period of adjustment, of learning. Um, but this was particularly unique because you were not just learning the ropes, you were also developing this role from, from scratch, the strategy, the mission, the goals. What were some of your guiding principles and mandates for yourself and for your team? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, my team and I also always say, like, we're not starting from zero, we're mm -hmm. starting from negative. Because mm -hmm. this really is frontier mm -hmm. work for the State mm -hmm. Department. Um, and so a lot of the work does in, entail um, internal sort of advocacy and mm -hmm. education, um, helping our colleagues understand not only why this is a foreign policy imperative, but also how they do it in a meaningful way mm -hmm. 
in their work across regions, across thematic areas. Um, and so what helped a lot was building upon the work and learning from my, my counterparts focus on other marginalized communities, mm. right? So I'm really honored to join the ranks of, um, of other principals and specials and ambassadors focused on other marginalized communities. That includes um, Ambassador Gita, our newly mm. um, confirmed ambassador for global women's issues, Jessica Stern, our mm. special envoy for LGBTQI plus rights, Sarah Mankara, our special advisor for international disability rights, Rashad Hussein, our ambassador at large for international religious freedom, and Deborah Lipstadt, our ambassador to, uh, to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Mm. So I joined them and collectively we are putting, um, we're making good on President Biden's and Secretary Blinken's promise to put human rights at the center of our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Because we have to acknowledge that for members of marginalized groups, again, that premise, that basic premise outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all people are born free and equal in dignity and rights, mm -hmm is still an aspiration, but not yet a reality. So building upon uh, their lessons, um, using their, their goodwill and leaning upon them and, and getting their guidance has been critical. But then at the core of this is engaging with and listening to marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous mm. communities themselves. Mm. That is so important for a number of reasons, right? One we cannot and we will not apply an American lens hmm. to this global problem, nor can we apply a one size fits all to this problem. So while racism is a global problem, we know that it manifests very differently in every country um, in the world. Mm -hmm. And so if we try to take a sort of one size blanket approach, it would fail. Mm -hmm. um, so that means it's harder, but if we do it right, it will be more impactful. Mm -hmm. And in order to do it right, we have to <clears throat> listen, we have to engage with, we have to partner with communities of African descent, indigenous communities, Roma communities, other marginalized mm -hmm. ethnic and racial communities, wherever we are, and talk to them because they know better than any of us the challenges that they're facing and what they need um, in terms of US government support or what we can be doing better to help them achieve equality and justice. Mm -hmm. They simply have just for far too long been excluded the from the conversations Absolutely. that impact them. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that my um, colleague, Sarah Mankara, special mm -hmm. advisor for international disability rights mm -hmm. always says is a, a common phrase of the disability community mm -hmm. is nothing about us without us. Um, and she actually likes to shorten it and say, just nothing without us, because everything mm. is about us. And mm. I, I steal that, because it's true for mm. <laughs> members of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities. Everything impacts us. So there should not be a conversation mm. where we are not a part of it. Absolutely. You make an excellent point about listening to them directly, not yeah. making assumptions, understanding uh, those, those nuances. Uh, you also mentioned special envoy Jessica Stern. We yes. had the, the honor uh, to host her last year for an event uh, here at CSIS. Desiree, you talked a little bit about internal advocacy and some of your, your partners at CSIS, uh, excuse me, your partners at the State Department who uh, focus on elevating historically marginalized, disadvantaged, or underserved communities. Where do you see your role fitting into these different um, individuals and their work at the State Department? Yeah, well, we have to work together in order to be effective, right? Um, because we know that the, a lot of the hatreds, for instance, are deeply interconnected. Mm -hmm. And one thing that my colleagues and I all say individually, and we're all right, is that our community is the canary in the coal mine. They may start by targeting LGBTQI mm -hmm. plus persons, mm -hmm. but they're not gonna end there. They may start by targeting Jewish people, mm -hmm but they're not gonna end there. And so um, one thing that Jessica Stern says so beautifully is we all either sink or rise together. Mm -hmm. So it's critically important that we stand in solidarity. The other reason why it's so important for us to work together is because we know that people can be many things at once, Absolutely. right? And because of those multiple identities, people can be subject to multiple and compounding forms of discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I am a black woman. That means I face racism and sexism. Mm -hmm. And so when I don't, take into account the most vulnerable and the most marginalized in communities of African descent, mm -hmm. in indigenous communities, then I'm falling short. Mm -hmm. And when my colleagues don't take into account that 
black LGBTQI plus persons, for instance, um, and other, you know, other members of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities within their communities are often the most vulnerable, then we fall short. So looking at the sort of um, least among us, right, the lowest common denominator, will create policies that actually serve everyone. Absolutely. That intersectional lens is exactly. key. And a lot of this work, just like you said, Desiree, cannot be done without this internal co collaboration. You're, you and your team have done quite a bit in the, in the past year, <laughs> so I want to ask you a little bit more about some of your accomplishments. And first, what was your, you'd say, one of your greatest policy accomplishments? Um, it is hard to narrow it down to just one, but I will focus on one that is sort of top of mind for me, um, and that is with Brazil. Um, so I was really honored to join our ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, to, uh, to Brazil, and we visited Salvador, which is the sort of heart of black Brazil, and it was the first time a cabinet member had traveled to Salvador um, in 15 years. And we went there with Brazil's Minister of Racial Equality mm -hmm. to announce the relaunch or the reinvigoration of, if you will, of our U.S.-Brazil Joint Action Plan to Eliminate Racism and Promote Equality, JAPER. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a huge moment because Brazil and the U.S. are so similar in mm -hmm. so many ways, mm -hmm. in so many ways. And it makes sense, excuse me, because of our common histories mm -hmm. um, with colonization, and with the um, enslavement and the transatlantic slave trade of Africans and their descendants. Um, so there are a lot of similarities and a lot of similar challenges as it pertains to indigenous rights, as it pertains to um, the systemic uh, racism that has prevented people of African descent from living up and reaching their full potential. And so we have a lot to learn from each other. And so I really like to emphasize that um, the P in JAPER is planned, but it also stands for partnership. Mm -hmm. It is a two-way street, right? Um, we may have some lessons that we can share with Brazil mm -hmm. on how we have um, tried to embed racial equity mm -hmm. through the federal government policies, for example, through Executive Order 13985. And I'm sure there are plenty of um, lessons that Brazil can share with us that we may be able to apply on how we can promote uh, equity uh, for, our, uh, for our communities of color here in the United States. And this is exactly connected to what you were sharing, Desiree, in your opening remarks, that global challenges yeah. require global responses. Now, I'm sure you have to deal with quite a bit of bureaucracy, navigate yes. bureaucracy as well. So what would you say is one of your greatest bureaucratic accomplishments? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this may sound... This may sound insignificant to those who have never engaged with the State Department, but for those of you who have had any experience with the State Department, you will know this is a big deal. We got a cable tag created. That is huge. <laughs> and so that means um, that we can now sort of document and um, categorize reporting from around the world that pertains to marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous groups. That's huge, y'all, because <laughs> it um, helps us keep track of the reporting, but it also encourages more reporting, right? So as a former reporting officer, again, I started my career as an FSO, mm -hmm. whenever I had a cable, it was, um, there was an incentive to add as many tags as possible so that as many folks would read it. Right, and so if I'm a reporting cable, uh, officer um, co covering human rights in Vietnam, for example, and I'm talking about, um, I don't know, a human rights issue, name, name it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, freedom of association issue, and I'm reporting that you know, 12 people happen to be arbitrarily detained uh, because of the, their association with this group. Um, it might incur, it might now be an additive incentive for me to say, well, wait a minute, what was their ethnicity of all those 12, mm -hmm. right? Um, because then we pick up on patterns. Mm -hmm. And in the scheme of things, 12 people may not sound like a huge deal, but if all 12 of them just happen to be from the same ethnic group, that might warrant a little bit more interrogation. Now, what is it about this ethnic group that maybe is um, causing the government to target them and their activities, right? And that, again, can be the canary in the coal mine. Because oftentimes, um, and I'm not singling out Vietnam, but oftentimes when we look at around the world, authoritarian leaders and authoritarian wannabe leaders mm -hmm. 
will find a group to scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And usually that group is already the most vulnerable, or already the most marginalized. And the unfortunate reality is because of our history, people of African descent and indigenous peoples and Roma people are consistently the most marginalized, pushed to the margins of society. So oftentimes we see them being sort of considered easy targets. Mm -hmm. um, and when we don't pick up on what's going on in their communities, we could be missing a harbinger of things to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you share any key accomplishments that your office has made because of the internal advocacy that you mentioned, the internal support within the State Department? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, most of the things we've accomplished mm -hmm. would not have been possible mm -hmm. if it weren't for partners mm -hmm. um, and supporters within the State Department. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I can think about are, is all the great work that we're doing multilaterally that would not be possible without my former colleagues um, in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs mm -hmm. um, and our wonderful colleagues at our mission to the UN in New York, our mission to the Human Rights Council in Geneva have been fantastic partners. Um, and necessarily so, right? Because a lot of these conversations are happening in these spaces with or without us, because these are global conversations. Um, one thing I always point to is proof that this is not just an American challenge, it's not just an American priority, is the work that UNESCO has done on anti-racism. Uh, we have not been members of UNESCO for several years. Um, I believe it was just announced that we are rejoining, our uh, rejoining of UNESCO was approved today, so yay, we're back in. <laughs> but while we were outside of UNESCO, UNESCO has done incredible work on anti-racism. Um, they created this toolkit on how member states can promote anti-racism in their policies, again, not just because it's the right thing to do, but in pursuit of a more robust democracy, in pursuit of more sustainable and inclusive economic growth, in pursuit of peace and stability, right? Um, and so I point to that all the time as proof that this is not just an American concept mm -hmm. or something that we are trying to jam down other people's throats. Mm -hmm. Desiree, something that I'm often worried about is the sustainability of the work. And you mentioned this in your opening remarks that um, collective effort is important to ensure sustainable work. Um, you're trying to institutionalize change, yeah. which, is, which is difficult. Yeah. What are some of the steps that you've taken and your team to ensure that this work is sustainable beyond your, your appointment? Yeah, I mean, that is my number one priority, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't want this to be... Um, something that is uh, just a, a couple year project. Mm -hmm. I envision this to be something that long outlasts my tenure mm -hmm. and hopefully my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and we are doing that, my team and I are doing that by helping our colleagues understand mm -hmm. what this work is and why it's important. And I am confident that once they get it, and they will see how much more effective our programs are, our policies are, and that is good for them, right? It's in our benefit to engage these communities, not to sort of go along with their marginalization or the inequities that exist. Um, I think, you know, the colleagues that I have met around the world when I travel, um, when we talk about it and when I explain to them what this work actually looks like, how they actually do it, it's like a light bulb goes mm -hmm. off, right? And for many of them, when they, um, are, they join me for meetings and I get to meet with members of um, communities of African descent or indigenous communities that have said, we've never met with anyone from the US mm -hmm. government, um, let alone had someone come in and wanna hear from us, right? And listen to us. I think that was kind of a gut punch to some of my colleagues, because mm. it was almost like, you know, I would look at them like, hey, you've been here for two years. <laughs> What's the deal, mm. right? And inevitably, they would hear something insightful from that meeting that would greatly contribute to what we're trying to do, mm. whether, again, it'd be on promoting food security, right, or um, combating climate change or building resilience to deal with the climate crisis. Um, and so they see the value add 
that this work brings to our uh, priorities. And so my hope is that that will help sustain the work. When you mentioned climate change, food security, this is all work that needs to intersect with what, your, what your office does. Uh, and you said, Desiree, explaining to colleagues what this work is, right? Yeah. Uh, in a recent conversation, you said that you will not accept that this work is controversial. Um, how have you handled backlash, resistance, or even just a lack of understanding of this, what this work is, both inside and outside of the State Department? Yeah, well, I try to handle it with grace. Uh, but that's hard sometimes um, when the arguments are um, not genuine, right? So I'm always happy to engage in a policy debate. But if the premise of your disagreement is rooted in um, the denial of my humanity, as one great writer said, I can't engage on that. I can't engage on that. Now, I, I don't know where that quote is from, but I, I believe I said it because, um, <laughs> because it's true. I mean, I, I just can't accept that this is, that it's controversial for me to say that every human being by virtue of being a human being should have the same dignity and rights as everyone else, regardless of their race or ethnicity. That is not controversial. Mm -hmm. And that is what this work is about. It again is about trying to bridge that divide between the stated um, fact and the stated truth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that every single human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights, and then the reality, in the lived reality, of far too many people of African descent, indigenous peoples, Roma peoples, and people of other marginalized racial and ethnic communities. That is not controversial. It shouldn't be in my in my mind. Yeah. Some of the work that we've done at CSIS is making the case that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a national security yeah. imperative. Um, how have you made that case within state or outside that it, this work contributes to our national security interests and policies and it, that it should be a bipartisan issue? Yeah. Um, you know, I, again, for me, it's a no brainer. It's, it's <laughs> obvious, right? When you have entire segments of your population of your country that are prevented from getting a quality education and then thereby prevented from getting a good job and then thereby prevented from actually contributing positively to your economy and prevented from supporting themselves and their families, what does that lead to? That actually leads to great breeding ground, recruit, uh, you know, sort of right recruitment for illicit actors, whether they be drug cartels, whether they are human traffickers, right? And so it is in, it should be <laughs> in a country's interest to ensure that everyone can productively contribute to their society, whether that is economically um, or whether that is uh, politically. Now, the economic argument tends to be the mm -hmm. easier one, so that's the one I focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and I was engaging with a, a Roma advocate and activist in Europe, and he brilliantly put it this way. Um, you know, Europe's, generally, the demographic of Europe's population is quite old. It's aging fast, and it's not growing very quickly. That is not true for the Roma population. The Roma population is young and it is growing quickly. So why wouldn't you take advantage of this youthful population as um, an, an obvious sort of ready-made uh, population that can not only um, contribute to your economy, but who can you know, be a skilled workforce that can um, help sort of offset the aging, the impact of the, your aging uh, populations. And so he lays it out much more articulately than I just did, um, but the data is there. And that, the economic piece tends to be really compelling as well as the security threat, right? Mm -hmm. When you don't allow people to get a job, <laughs> then they will turn to illicit activities to survive. That's just human nature. The data point is key yeah. in moving forward on these issues. Desiree, we t talked qu quite a bit about accomplishments, wins uh, for your office. Now looking ahead, what would you like to accomplish within the, the next year in your role? Oh, um, so much, right? There's so much work to be done. This is, this is the challenge of this work because it's urgent and it's ever present, like it's everywhere. And so a lot of the, the work that, the, the difficulty of my job is assessing 
where can we really lean in and where do we have to say, okay, maybe not this year, but, but next year. So I would say, you know, in the next year, I really hope to um, continue to hammer down the point that this is a global challenge. Mm -hmm. So in the first year, I've challenged to five of the six regions that the State Department covers. Mm -hmm. um, I will be traveling. I, the one I haven't gone to yet is South Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will be going in a few months. And so once I hit that, then I will have been to every country in each of those regions. And that's really important to underscore, again, the global nature. This is not just a problem of the Americas, right? This is not just an American problem. It really does affect every society in a myriad of ways. And so I think, you know, if we're able to um, underscore the global nature of this to our colleagues, but also equip them with the tools, with the language, with the knowledge, um, to be able to comfortably do this work um, in a robust and meaningful way uh, without sort of relying on us, on my team or me to come and travel there and say, you know, this is how you do it. That would be a huge marker of success. And we're trying to facilitate that sort of brain trust in the community of learning. Um, we have stood up uh, a community of practice that includes colleagues from not just Washington, but from our embassies and consulates around the world. And this is critically important because it allows them to talk to each other and to engage with each other. So, you know, we, and what we try to do is we try to spotlight a um, embassy or a consulate at every one of those meetings where they can talk about the policy that they have been doing or the program that they have enacted to try and support the human rights of communities of African descent, of indigenous communities, of Roma communities, of other communities. And that has been really helpful in getting people to understand what this looks like in a practical way. Absolutely. We'll be turning it over to audience Q&A here in a few minutes. Um, Desiree, I want to ask you about how ideally would US foreign policy change mm -hmm. if your work um, you know, keeps being implemented. I'll share with you this quote from Senate Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Bob Menendez, who said regarding your appointment, he said, your appointment will play a critical role in streamlining U.S. efforts to secure human rights and fight inequality around the world. How would U.S. foreign policy ideally change because of the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, ideally, uh, our, the way we conduct foreign policy will change in that there will be a universal recognition that for every crisis, for every topic, members of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities are differently and disproportionately impacted. Mm -hmm. And that is true across the board, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about food insecurity, democratic backsliding, mm -hmm. COVID-19, mm -hmm. economic inequality. And when we fail to acknowledge that, our policy responses, our programmatic responses fall short. And so for me, it would be ideal if that just becomes second nature mm -hmm. in the way that I think um, my colleagues in the Office of Global Women's Issues mm -hmm. have finally managed to do. Mm -hmm. But I will also temper expectations. That took a long time, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the things I always remind myself when I get sort of antsy and um, impatient with the, the lack of, or the pace of progress, mm -hmm. is of um, an African proverb that used to be pasted on the Joburg airport when you disembarked your plane. And it was, you know, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And I wanna go far. So, so we have to go together. We have to go together. Yeah. And that means Absolutely. bringing everybody along. Absolutely. I'd love to turn it over to audience uh, questions. If you do have a question, if you can briefly introduce yourself and share a brief question as well, um, <laughs> you are able to go to the mic over here if you all want to line up. We'll be taking in-person questions and my colleague Rafi will be sharing some online questions as well. Please. It's not on. Check, check, check. There you go. Perfect. There, there we go. Great. Thanks. I'd like to hear a word of optimism from you. I know you have a very trying job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My name is Todd Wiggins. I appreciate uh, what you do. And I wanted to ask you, I know you have your challenges and there are times when you maybe even want to cry yourself to sleep, but let's ask you <laughs> what you found most beneficial 
in your methodology? Mm. What's, what, call, what gives you the competitive advantage to do the job that you do besides that beautiful suit you're wearing, by the way? It's just <laughs> 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 yeah. but, but beyond that, tell me about, a little bit about the language skills. You said that you've been to so many different countries and you want to round it out completely. And that yeah. gives you, that you say that's mandatory in order to be sufficient at what you do. But tell me a little bit about where you, that salient point in your life recently where you said, I know I can do this and this is why <laughs> here's, put this on my resume. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have that moment, but I can tell you what gives me hope and why I keep doing this work. Mm -hmm. And it is the engagement with members of these communities. And I was frankly nervous um, when I first uh, traveled in this role. I didn't know what reception I would get, right? I didn't know if um, people would say, well, you're a hypocrite because you guys are still struggling with racism, how, how could you do this role? It was actually quite the contrary. It was the exact opposite reception. My first trip in this role was to Colombia. And it was to, I was part of the presidential delegation to the inauguration of President Petro and Vice President Marquez, Francia Marquez, the first black vice president of that country. And as part of that trip, um, as is standard for any time I travel, I engage with members of um, of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities. And I was engaging with uh, members of the Afro-Colombian community, and they said, you finally see us. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so touching, um, because as they put it, um, when we didn't talk explicitly about race, we were kind of invisibilizing them. And so it was really powerful and a really um, strong affirmation at the beginning of this tenure that has kept me going because in, in various iterations I've heard the same thing of com from community members um, wherever I go particularly um, communities of African descent and particularly indigenous communities that have never engaged with a U.S. government official mm -hmm. um, or someone who is you know senior level official from D.C. who traveled to that country mm -hmm. to meet them and prioritize meeting them over the foreign minister right for me it's much more important to engage with with communities and civil society, then frankly it is about engaging with government representatives because my work is looking at our own policies. It's looking at how we are engaging with these communities. Thanks. Uh, my name is Maria Marif. I'm an attorney and I work in the DEI space. I have a couple of questions for you. Thank you uh, for, to CSIS for hosting this and Desiree for your time today. Um, my first question is about, um, you hinted at this, but when we talk about diversity and equity globally, how do we talk about you know, the recent sort of clawing back of rights in this country, whether it's the US uh, Supreme Court's decision striking down affirmative action or anti-LGBTQ plus uh, legislation, le legislation various states. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is about public-private partnership. Um, are you exploring um, you know, opportunities to partner with uh, companies to leverage the human and financial resources? Yes. Let me start with the second one because that's the easier one. Absolutely. We love a good PPP, right? And I spent <laughs> several, several years of my career in the private sector, and so I know the power of the private sector, um, particularly because of the resources they can bring to bear. Um, and so we have um, engaged with foundations, but also private companies um, to see if we can find ways to collaborate on um, promoting, again, equality for, for underrepresented groups. One example is um, one, I, can't, I think it was Intel, it was a recent recipient of the Secretary's Award for Corporate Excellence. Um, because of their work in Costa Rica, uh, they have created a, uh, an apprenticeship program specifically for um, black Costa Ricans and indigenous Costa Ricans. And so I immediately reached out to them to, you know, not only commend them for the great work, but to see how we can, they could potentially expand it to other countries in the region, but then also take it a, t a step further, right? Like it's great to have these kinds of programs that address the immediate, uh, or sort of stop the pain and help a few dozen folks, but how can we leverage that into actually addressing the structural issues that cause those problems in the first place? That's where I'm interested, right? That's, what, that's, that's that where I think the private sector in particular can be quite powerful and quite influential. So yes, absolutely PPPs. The first question is so hard, um, but it really does underscore 
that we are not the only country, like we are obviously grappling with problems in the United States. And that's why I necessarily engage in this work and lead with a great deal of humility, right? Because everyone can see what's going on here in the United States. And when we have um, a sort of regression of, of, of rights uh, for uh, black people, for people of color, for LGBTQI plus folks, it does make my job harder. But it um, reinforces my desire to do this work because we see, and my, my colleague, Special Envoy Jessica Stern for LGBTQI plus rights talks about this so eloquently because she has the same problem. But she noted, and I think it's very true, that a lot of these anti-LGBTQI plus legislations are exported, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They've gotten ideas from other countries and they bring it here and then we kind of export these bad things too. It's the same for racism, particularly for violent white extremism, right? We saw this, this shooter in Buffalo curbed his manifesto from a shooter in New Zealand. So, you know, these, the groups that sort of perpetuate hate and racism, they don't know any borders. So those of us who are trying to promote a more equal and just world for all people should also know no borders. We, we also have to collaborate in order to, to, to make progress. But yeah, it's hard. Thank you so much, Special Representative, for joining us today. I have some online questions. Um, I'm going to combine two because, of course, there's a lot about the Supreme Court rulings. Um, one question from Genevieve. Will ethnic diversity in U.S. foreign policy be compromised due to this latest Supreme Court ruling against using uh, race as an enrollment factor in colleges? And then another question from Lauren. They say, I think yesterday's Supreme Court decision against affirmative action makes sense only if you think we're all starting at the same starting line. If you think that past discriminations don't matter and that there's no current discrimination, how do you get people to understand this isn't true? Yeah, oh, that's really great questions. Um, you know, on the first question, I would just refer everyone to the president's statement yesterday in response to the Supreme Court decision. Um, it was a really strong and a really robust mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. and. He, he said that obviously we'll have to comply with the Supreme Court's decision, but that does in no way impact or lessen our resolve mm -hmm. to promote racial equity and justice, period. So on that, I would refer uh, the, the person joining us to just watch the president's statement because I thought it was really powerful. On the other question about how to help folks understand that we're not starting at the same point, um, it's such a good question and it gives me a good reason to explain why my title is racial equity mm -hmm. and justice, not racial equality and justice. Mm -hmm. So equity is a means to equality. Equality is the goal, right? But we know that not everyone is starting at the same starting point, so we will require equity to get there. Mm -hmm. And I was in Poland um, and I was having dinner with a, a colleague, a local um, colleague, a Polish woman who works at the embassy. And she said, what does equity mean? Why, why does your title say equity? And I, I tried to explain to her and she just kind of looked puzzled and I said, um, let me talk you through a picture that is really, became really popular in the US following the murder of George Floyd. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know about. what I'm talking about? Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen, if you do, I'm sorry for being redundant. So I said, picture three people behind a fence. One person is tall enough on his own to see over the fence. The middle person is not quite there yet, but maybe if he stands on his tippy toes, he can see over the fence. And the third person is too short to see over the fence, even if he or she or they tried, like if they jumped or whatever. And then second picture, so that is the reality, right? Equality would be giving each one of those persons a stool of the same height. So that means the tall guy who didn't need a stool now gets a stool and can see even more over the fence. That's not necessary, he already saw over the fence. The middle guy now can see over the fence because the stool was tall enough for him. But the short person still can't see over the fence because the stool is not big enough to get him over the fence in terms of eyesight. That's equality. Equity is giving each of them the stool of the size they need to see over the fence at the same level. And so that means the tall guy does not get a stool but nothing gets taken away from the tall guy. He can still see over the fence. We're not digging a hole for him, right? Nothing is getting taken away from him, okay? He can still see over the fence, he's good. 
middle guy gets the stool of the size he needs to now see over the fence, same as the tall guy. And then the short person gets a stool that is tall enough to now allow him to see over the fence at the same level as everyone else. That's equity. Justice is removing the fence altogether. That is our goal. We don't need a fence. We don't need a fence. And the fear often is that that tall guy is going to lose something yeah. as a result of as this, if, right? Like, yeah, the huh? fear is that, oh no, you're giving the mm -hmm. short guy a big stool and mm -hmm. then somehow the fence will get taller. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. the fence is not getting taller. Mm -hmm. I would like to take all questions. I'm going to do my best. Desiree, do you mind if we come take a few questions sure. at a time? Just for the sake of time, Maher. Yeah, uh, so I'm, sorry, just switching this up a little bit. Uh, my name is Meher Akhtami. I am the manager of a program dedicated to working with a bunch of different civil society organizations in the peace and security field to try and grapple with racism, white supremacy, and numerous other things. My question is gonna be around that second piece of that two-prong two issue. So how does white supremacy factor into your approach as far as trying to grapple with race, racial equity, its deleterious effects, its interconnected effects with prejudice and racism and discrimination, and the fact that it does affect all of us internationally and has forever, basically. Um, connected to that, how do you grapple with the somewhat complicated history of the State Department around exporting imperialist ideals and racism and white supremacy itself in your work. Yeah, so, you know, I think it is, oh, sorry, we're supposed to take a few questions. Mind if we take sure. one more? Hi, good afternoon, Roland Kennedy Jr. from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So my question is about institutions like mine that you alluded to a little bit. Um, thinking about philanthropy does not like risk it likes sure bets and it often doesn't take into account the innovation required for the work that you both do so curious if you were thinking about an annual report or mm -hmm. some sort of evaluation maybe mm -hmm. at the end of the first second or third year of your work um, that you could collaborate on or that you could share with mm -hmm. a sector like mine to consider funding opportunities to continue this work for the long term yeah thank you Okay, on the first question, you know, I think it is really remarkable that we now have a president and a secretary of state that have acknowledged that we haven't always been on the right side of history. Now that may be sort of like obvious for many of us, but to have people in those positions actually acknowledge that, hey, maybe our foreign policy wasn't always um, positive, right, or didn't actually contribute positively to the development or the democracy in this country, that's huge. So that is a step in the right direction. Um, in terms of dealing with uh, white supremacy, that is, um, it's a, as you said, it's a global threat, right? So when we look at racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, white supremacy is at the top of that. And so those who engage in violent white supremacy, again, they know no borders. They are talking to each other from across continents. And so our solutions have to also cross continents and national borders. And so we are engaged with our colleagues in the Counterterrorism Bureau to ensure that our efforts to combat racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism don't just focus on the per perpetuators of the violence, but also the victims and the targets of that violence, right? Um, and that is something that I think, again, would make our policies stronger because those communities, as the most impacted, um, could have interesting solutions that we may not have thought about. So that, that's what we're trying to do. On the question of, of whether or not we're gonna be doing an annual, annual report, the short answer is no, and that is very much on purpose. If I came into this role and I said to my colleagues at the State Department, my already overburdened FSO colleagues at embassies and consulates around the world that have to do the human rights report, the trafficking in persons report, the international freedom report. I'm going to, uh, hi, I'm new, and I'm gonna to add to you another annual report. They would have ran me off. They would have ran me off. So I thought, how can we be more strategic about this? Why don't we ensure a lens, a racial and ethnic equity lens into the reports they already have to do? And that has actually really made these reports much more robust and interesting and insightful. Because again, if you're talking about trafficking in persons and you say, okay, there were only 100 people trafficked in this country from this reporting period, that doesn't sound bad. 
But if you say, wait, there have been 100 people, and of those 100, 99 of them have been black women, well, what are we doing with black women, right? Like, are we actually engaging this community? Are we working with civil society that is led by black women to talk about why this is such a problem and why they're being targeted? And then thereby, how do we come up with robust solutions? If we don't incorporate, because we live in a racialized world, when we don't acknowledge that race is a factor in many of these issues, again, we fall short. We can't just ignore racism away. And so that is how we've been trying to incorporate this work. And um, so far, I've gotten great feedback from colleagues in civil society that, um, particularly in the trafficking in persons report, they really did appreciate that new nuance. That lens need, needs to be embedded in everything. Exactly. Not just separate. Unfortunately, my team has informed me that I can only take two questions. So whoever was next, if you keep sure. it one question, my and I'll take one more person. Michael Chek Kim at the State Department. Hey, Michael. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we Michael know each used other to work with I, me. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for um, the special representative a couple years ago. She's brilliant. She's great to work for. Oh, so thank you. big plug for her. Um, mm -hmm. Y'all hear My question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying that to my team. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so how do you engage countries that are very homogeneous, like Japan or Egypt? or Finland. I, I thought that was quite insightful, what you said, uh, your engagement with the Polish locally employed staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take one more. Whoever was next. Oh, Ooh. should we just have, we, they can ask quickly and then I'll try to give if quick answers. Very speedy, so it, Thank you so much for your writing. time. <laughs> yeah. My name is Maxwell Lawson. I'm a 2023 USAID Payne Fellow. So it's oh, great congratulations. to see you. Congratulations. Yeah, in a um, leadership position. And my question was a little related of if you've experienced pushback from countries that are more homogeneous or aren't willing to incorporate marginalized communities into the government. Yep. Thank you. Should we just add them? Super quick. Super sure. quick. I'll make it as quick as possible first. I apologize, last year, BPIA at the park, I came to see you and celebrate your uh, new recruitment, Thank your new you. position, but I didn't see you there. <laughs> Too many people. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, not, it's, for, it's my fault, not your fault. Uh, a, two questions about looking inwards. In terms of marginalized communities, we have a lot of problems with retaining uh, foreign services, civil service persons mm -hmm. at state. And recently, um, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Stanley just actually resigned. Yeah. I just want to have your feedback on that, if you can speak about yeah. marginalized communities and mm -hmm. the problems of retaining people yep. at the State Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We won't leave you the last one, so super quick. Okay. okay. My name's Shanna. I'm a graduate student at NYU. My, uh, first of all, thank you for coming here. It's such a pleasure to hear your talk. Um, my question was more so, when you spoke about Brazil, I wondered if you'd seen any policies while there that you felt could fast track our country to a more equitable society. Um, okay, let me start with the question about uh, our chief diversity and inclusion officer, mm -hmm. there was a, f I wanna make a factual correction. She did not resign, she retired. So she has had a long career in the foreign service. Um, and so she retired after 30, maybe 40 years, 30 years. Um, and so I don't want to give the impression that she sort of quit. Um, the work that the chief diversity and inclusion office and officer uh, is doing obviously supports and complements the work that I'm trying to do but it is distinct, mm -hmm. right? So they are looking internally at how to make the State Department and our uh, workforce look like the country that we are representing. Super important. Also super important to remind y'all that that includes, includes racial diversity, but is broader than just racial diversity. So it's also about gender diversity. It's about diversity for LGBTQI plus mm -hmm. folks, persons with disabilities, women, um, you know, everyone mm -hmm. run the gamut. So look like the beautiful diversity of our country. Um, on the question of how I engage um, countries where there is no racism, that's just not true, right? That's just not true. I've met recently with a, a person of African descent from one of these, I can't remember, one of the Slavic countries mm -hmm. that is usually assumed to be quite homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And she said, no one ever sees us because, but, and they'll say that racism is not a problem, but that's because they never asked me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are black people everywhere. Who are we listening to? Right? <laughs> there are um, indigenous peoples everywhere, right? There are members of marginalized racial, ethnic, and indigenous mm -hmm. communities everywhere. It's just who do we see mm -hmm. 
and who do we talk to? Yeah. And so I push back on the notion mm -hmm. that there are homogeneous mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. because I have yet to meet um, people who live in those mm -hmm. countries who have said, yeah, there's no racism here, there's no problems here, right? Um, and so it's just a, a, a matter of whether or not countries are willing to confront it in an open and honest manner. Mm -hmm. The other important thing I would note about that question in particular is that, again, my priority is not necessarily engaging with governments. It's mm -hmm. great when I can, mm -hmm. it's really awesome when I can. But when I can't, that's okay. Because again, this work is about looking at US policies, mm -hmm. looking at how we are engaging in the country and how we are supporting the human rights of these communities. So it's more important that I'm engaging with these communities themselves and the civil society groups that are supporting their work um, and their efforts towards equality than with government ministries. That's not to say that I don't care about government engagement. It's just saying for my work, it really is more important to actually engage with these communities. Um, and then the other question was about... The question about retention. Retention. Um, the, again, that's the work of the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Office. So the question about the last question about Brazil and if you've seen any Ah, policies. Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brazil, again, similar to the U.S., uh, they just elected a new president that has uh, put uh, racial equality as a priority. And it's still very young. Mm -hmm. You know, I, as I was talking to the Minister for Racial Equality um, a few months ago, she reminded me it's only been six months. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, I'm sure that there will be policies that um, have proven effective in terms of promoting more equality. But right now, they're very much in a nascent stage and they are very much trying to um, rebuild from the devastation mm -hmm. um, under the last administration in terms of um, opportunities for people of African descent, but also uh, the real stigmatization and marginalization of indigenous peoples across Brazil. And so they uh, do not have an easy task ahead of them, but with ministers like Minister Franco, Minister for the new, brand new minister for indigenous people, Sonia Guajajara, um, and the commitment of the president, um, I'm hopeful that they can make progress. But the challenge is this work is urgent and it is also personal, right? This, we're not talking about statistics, we're not talking about theories, we're talking about people's lives. Mm -hmm. And many of these people were so desperate for change that they kind of put all of their hopes into mm -hmm. a vote for a new administration. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true here too, right? Mm -hmm. The expectations are quite high mm -hmm. for some sort of relief um, immediately. And that's hard to deliver. That's really hard to deliver. Absolutely. Desiree, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you for your... Absolutely. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to your work and the work of your, your team. I wish you all the best for, for the year to come. And hopefully we have the chance to host you here again and your team next year to hear more about your wonderful um, accomplishments. Uh, before we transition to the reception, I'd love to thank a few people. Uh, without them, this event today would not be possible. Uh, I'd like to thank you all, of course, for joining <laughs> us here in person and online. I'd like to thank um, Claire as well um, on uh, the special representative team. <laughs> did a phenomenal job to, to make this event happen. Darius, Jessica, and anyone else that I've missed uh, from your office, thank you to all of you. Uh, I'd like to express my immense gratitude to my team, Naz and Rafi. This event would not be possible uh, without them. There's also quite a few interns that helped today uh, <laughs> to make uh, the event happen. Uh, Leah, Federico, Nani, um, thank you to all of you for, for making today happen as well. Uh, I'd also love to thank our streaming and broadcasting team who do a phenomenal job to ma in making these events accessible to uh, the audience online. Duane, Chi, Craig, Theo, thank you to all of you. Um, and lastly, thank you to our conferencing uh, team at, at CSIS who put a wonderful uh, reception right outside. So I would love to welcome all of you right outside this room in the atrium for some wonderful drinks and food and hopefully you all can spend some time next Working. Thank you all again for joining us here in Desiree. It was a pleasure to host you. Thank you for having me.